Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome. And uh, I'm here with John Coleman, my partner, and a favorite friend of ours, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. How are you doing, John and John? John, you're looking good. Good Thank morning. You. Very well. I uh, had my first gin and tonic this morning. I'll be fine. At lunch. <laughs> <laughs> gin and tonic. We'll talk about that another time because that's a drink. That is a drink that I haven't heard uh, asked for in many, many years. I'll is have it still. I'll have gin and tonic, please. Drink. I'll have <laughs> yes. One of my favorite growing up. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it, it must be an East Coast drink. Anyway, John. We're not yeah. talking about gin and tonics today. We're talking about Vegas. Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. Okay, I'm not Elvis, I know. But Vegas, Art and I being in Southern California, Vegas is like a, what do you want to do today? I don't know. Let's go to Vegas. You know, it's a reasonably drive. It's a okay. half a day's drive. Yeah. And people go there left or used to before COVID-19. Uh, left, right, and sideways for not only the gambling, but the food, the food. And there's some nice, interesting touristy things to do around Las Vegas, which people don't think about. But um, the right reason on. I bring up Las Vegas is uh, I read that they're hurting terribly. Uh, it's a tourist town, and, and they're in deep, uh, deep trouble. And I wondered what you've heard recently restaurants uh, in Las Vegas, because – Boy, every famous chef opened up a restaurant in Las Vegas, didn't they? Or were paid to, yeah. One, one or the other, a management contract, generally speaking. Um, yeah, the history of Las Vegas dining is uh, fascinating because before 1999, <clears throat> the majority of restaurants in Las Vegas were flamboyant, uh, fake tinsel type of places serving continental food and uh and gazpacho, and, and, uh, and or it was a steakhouse. I mean, there was very little else, okay? And that's what people expected, that's what people wanted, and they wanted the red brocade wallpaper and the gilded uh, mirrors and so forth. That was Las Vegas. It's, it was the Las Vegas of the original Ocean's Eleven with um, with Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. and Peter Lawford. And um, people, people wanted it to be that way. Um, they realized people like Steve Wynn and others saw the handwriting on the wall that that may not last forever and fashions do change and that we cannot depend upon the blue haired old ladies who come into the slot machines and the uh, occasional uh, gambler who comes in for uh, roulette and so forth. We have to have a broader reason to come to Las Vegas and the whole idea of uh, Sin City was changed to what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, okay? And then they got kind of rid of that. For a while, they, they put in amusement parks for children and families, and that really bombed. <laughs> it was, I mean, who's going to take your kids to Vegas? The smartest thing they did was to bring in some of, as you noted, some of the world's most famous chefs and restaurants in the late 1990s. And Wynn was the first to do it at the Borgata, and then um, at uh, the other restaurant, the other casinos had to follow quickly. So you would have Emeril Lagasse, Jean-Georges von Gerichten. You would have the great French chefs like Guy Savoie uh, all opening. And as I said, sometimes management contracts, which means they had very little to do with uh, choosing of the staff, except for maybe a maitre d' and one chef. And their contracts call for them to be there twice a year. I once spoke to Steve Wynn, and uh, he had opened uh, Jean-Georges von Gerichten's steakhouse out there, which is called Prime, and uh, years went by, and uh, he ran into Wynn, as Jean-Georges did, and he ran into Wynn, and Steve said, my God, I haven't seen you for four years here in Vegas, and Jean-Georges says, yeah, that was the last time I was here. So anybody <laughs> expect to see him, or Jada de Laurentiis, uh, making pasta or uh, Cajun bam food out there. I mean, <laughs> the likelihood is you're probably more likely to win two million bucks at the. Uh, at the... <laughs> um, that said, Vegas has always been a boom or bust town, largely 
uh, especially over the last 20 years when entertainment and restaurants have um, stabilized the, um, the lack of gambling that was dropping, or the, the gambling, gaming, uh, which was dropping in favor of these other reasons to come to Vegas, another kind of glamour, fabulous entertainers, if you consider Celine Dion, fabulous entertainers. Um, you know, in the old days, it was, what's that guy, Wayne Newton singing uh, Danke Shane 365 <laughs> days a year, or now we got Celine Dion uh, singing My Heart Will Go On um, for three months a year. So they did a good job, but uh, Vegas has always been a boom bust economy, <clears throat> largely uh, dependent upon conventions. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in the early uh, 20 aughts, um, 20 knots, whatever you call them, uh, they stole away from Chicago specifically and other big convention cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, not so much in New York, but on the other side of the continent. Um, the convention business, the auto shows, the electronic shows, the big tech shows, the uh, orthopedic surgeons of the world, and so forth. They got these. Well, that's fine until something happens like 9-11, when Las Vegas went flat. 2008, when the economy caved, Los, uh, uh, Las Vegas went flatter than a pancake. And now during COVID, since most places are not even open and nobody's booking a convention now or in the near future, I doubt very much that anybody's booking a convention for next March, April, May, June. Um, I know the restaurant here in, uh, in New York, which lost all of its wedding business, but they all rebooked for next May and June. Well, you know, good luck to everybody. I hope it's all passed by then. So Vegas is very, very prone to those kind of down, downturns. And the restaurants specifically and the restaurants that are the most vulnerable are those for these so-called high rollers who were always comped. So these guys would go into uh, Guy Stavroir. And they said, well, monsieur, we have a 15-course menu prepared for you. We are going to begin with a little canapé of caviar and then perhaps a little foie gras. And the guy would say, just give me a goddamn steak and burn it. Uh, <laughs> so the, those guys are gone. And pretty much everybody else is gone at the moment. So it's very dire. And uh, if I were to predict how many of the high-end restaurants owned by the high-end chefs will survive, I would say it's probably not going to be more than 25%. And also the management contracts come up for renewal. So are they going to sign for a large amount of money a high-end chef who, I don't know, could be making a million dollars off the the management contract over three to five years, something like that, um, without any profits coming in. It's highly unlikely that Las Vegas will continue along that route. You know, it's kind of you interesting, the, uh, uh, the Vegas uh, phenomenon, and I used to go there two or three times a, a year for various uh, uh, high-tech shows, uh, computer graphics. Uh, How many uh, times did you get married overnight? Hmm? Uh, actually, once, uh, 55 years ago. Uh, but not in Vegas, in the Bronx, in the Bronx. <laughs> um, but in any event, I think around the time that they really, uh, the high-end restaurants came in, another phenomenon was happening as well. I think to draw the families, uh, the spouses of convention goers, uh, in addition to the uh, high-end shopping, which they've always had somewhat, right. but it really exploded, but also the uh, Broadway shows the broad and, and high caliber cast. So they came in, and then also the Cirque, Cirque du Soleil. So, so not just the normal strip shows uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Vegas dancers, but a traditional fair. So mm -hmm. I think that almost, well, not quite hand in hand, uh, I think uh, began to happen as they wanted to have a, a wider appeal to bring a spouse who would then spend money at shops and gamble, uh, whatever yeah, they do during the day. A spouse did not want to go to the so-called strip shows. Right, uh, exactly. Desire to see a bunch of naked women dancing around while their husbands are banging the table. Um, so, you, so there's very little nudity uh, left in those shows. 
But in any yeah. event, I think a, a lot of that happened there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, uh, and there are also the overseas uh, destinations that are similar to Macau. Is it Macau? Uh, uh, overseas gambling meccas. And I, sure. I assume that they're probably hurting as well. Oh, I'm sure they are because, uh, well, because Macau draws heavily from very wealthy Asians. There are not too many Americans are hopping on planes to Macau. It takes like nine days to get there, you know. Um, but it is an enormously successful uh, uh, casino uh, town because it draws from all the wealthy people from Malaysia and China and the, uh, the oligarchs from from uh, Japan and so forth. Um and the and also the Asians and especially the Chinese love to gamble. I mean, they really, really yeah. love to gamble. <clears throat> it's part of their uh, heritage. Well, John, one of the things that I uh, I always like about the virtual gourmet is uh, your regular contributor, John Curtis, uh, writes about Las Vegas. He's a I I assume a re a resident of Las Vegas. He's a regular uh, critic there. Is am I correct? Yeah, John is a uh, lawyer. Don't hold that against him. John, <laughs> and it's C-U-R-T-A-S. Uh, if you want to go, just go to John, Google John A. Curtis, C-U-R-T-A-S, Las Vegas, and you'll get his blog. And Or you can read him on my uh, blog, the Virtual Gourmet Newsletter, which is going to johnmariani.com. <clears throat> but John um, is not originally from uh, Las Vegas, but he's been there many, many, many years. He's gone through uh, uh, two wives uh, there, <laughs> learned a lot in that respect. Um, and uh, he's very knowledgeable because he goes out to eat every single night of his life, pretty much. And uh, this this pandemic has been killing him because he hasn't been able to go out to dinner. But uh, and it's interesting that John uh, early on uh, we would have these uh, uh, battles that he I didn't think he was taking the the pandemic seriously enough. Um, but he certainly come around. I would never ever recommend anybody go to a restaurant in Vegas without uh, wearing a mask and doing all due diligence. But he does have his finger on uh, what's going on and can tell you not only what's open, but what's changed. And he has been a big, big um, promoter of restaurants, especially ethnic restaurants off the strip, which is a category which has grown great in the last 20 years, whereby nobody went off the strip. Um, but there are a lot more locals, a lot more people who live in Las Vegas at this point. So to go all off the strip to a great Thai restaurant or, or a great uh, uh, restaurant of any stripe, pizzeria, Italian restaurant off the strip by five miles, ten miles, whatever, um, is something that he highly, highly recommends. And yeah. better food or, or you'll get food just as good at a much cheaper price than you would at any of the casinos where um, one of the geese of which I mentioned is a French restaurant. The cheapest appetizer on the menu is $82. Uh, oh, sinful. And that's ain't caviar. Yeah. You know, uh, going to conventions over the years, many years in, in Las Vegas, we um, were searching for non-casino restaurants that uh, had good food. And you're right. Over the years, they grew and they grew. Our favorite, and I don't think it's there anymore, it was the Tillerman. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful uh, fish and steaks. And it was uh, a couple off, a couple of miles down Florida Avenue, I think. But um, there are a lot of those. Uh, at least there were the last time I was there. It's about three years ago since I've been there. Wow. Um, you know, they opened a strip mall, which is where you always find the ethnic restaurants. It's all, you find a strip mall. There's going to be a Chinese restaurant right next door. There's going to be a Thai restaurant next door. There's going to be a Mexican <laughs> restaurant, um, which I think is good. Yeah. 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 Well, Vegas is a great town. I've I've always loved it, um, and I think it really offers more than than the the image that they offer up. I mean, it's got a lot of natural wonders nearby. Um, Red Rock. So it's a great tourist town. The Red Rock country is some of the most beautiful country in America, and then there's Hoover Dam, one of the. Yeah. Eighth wonders of the world. Yeah, yeah, and and we've traveled up into the desert, into the uh, old ghost towns, things like that. At any rate, thank but, you for this wait, 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 wait. Las Vegas everybody, update. Everybody on this uh, uh, video cast, raise your hand if you were at the Hoover Dam, we could actually walk through it. 
Ooh. Oh. Come on, Art. Yeah, you used to be able to go down and walk through. You can't anymore. Come well, on, Art. You're not that old, are you? You used, to, you used to be able to take an elevator down, walk yeah. through it, and then come up another elevator on the other side. Wow. And they closed yeah. that. They closed that about 10 years ago. Wow. Know, yeah, the turbine rooms and everything. Um, right. Yeah. Built in record time. Took them less time than they thought they were going to need. Right. And I, I, uh, what I went through when I was a kid, I remember they talked about the concrete was still drying. They did it in such a way that it would take like 30 years, but the stuff that had to be hard was yeah. solid. Yeah. Great. And it was built during the Depression. Yep. Yep. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> we we'll look forward to seeing you again, John. Thank you so much for your tour of Las Vegas. And say hello to John Curtis for us when you when you talk to him again. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.